Struggling to monitor the growing threat landscape? Pressure to reduce costs? Security skill gaps? Facing compliance issues? These issues can translate to operational, financial, regulatory, and reputational risks to your business. Checkpoint can help. Checkpoint combines an MSSP enablement program, cloud-delivered multi-tenant management, SOC platform, and superior threat intelligence capabilities to give MSSPs the confidence to grow profitably at a reduced risk. Checkpoint is 100% channel-driven. We partner to deliver the best security everywhere. Visit msspalert.com slash checkpoint. All right, welcome back to Cyber for Hire, the Managed Security Podcast. Once again, I'm Bradley Barth with SC Media. In the first half of our show, we talked with Pete Bowers at Norm about improving your resilience through a combination of people, process, and technology. Right now, I'd like to welcome back in my co-host, Ryan Morris from Morris Management Partners, because it's time for us to examine our uh, MSSP business and industry topic of the week. So presenting our big idea in business, rehabilitating your reputation after a security setback. The worst has happened. You failed to protect one or more managed services clients from a cyber attack. Maybe you were even infected yourself, or perhaps a failed product launch or a negative engagement with a customer has resulted in a scathing review. There are lots of ways an MSSP can wind up with a tattered reputation, and sometimes they're not even fully to blame. And that's why a good incident response and disaster recovery plan means not only getting your IT networks up and operational again, it also means salvaging your reputation and not letting this incident define you. This session will look at strategies for restoring your image after something goes very wrong. Uh, so, uh, Ryan, as always, let's jump right into it. Uh, I think the place to start here is just how bad is a bad reputation? We have seen some precedent of there being instances of companies suffering a, a major breach, and sometimes they take an initial hit with their reputation, but then uh, we'll see that, uh, let's just say if it's more of a, a business-to-consumer type company, uh, we'll see, like, Target is a great uh, example of one where it suffered a, a, a big breach and eventually, uh, you know, the customers all still kept flocking back and uh, over the long term, uh, no major damage to business. But do the same rules apply to an MSSP when they experience a damaging breach or they fail to protect a client from a breach that realistically uh, sh they should have caught? Uh, is it as easy for them to come back from something like that uh, with their customer base? See, I, I think you make an absolutely critical distinction there. Um, the difference between the end user organization having a security breach in their own systems, exposing data of their own customers. Uh, in the industry, we like to talk about that as an existential activity, like, oh, no, you suffered a breach. You might literally cease to exist as an entity, except that those consequences literally never happen. Now, every rule exists for the exception uh, to, to be proven, and there are exceptions when small or particularly exposed or brittle organizations suffer. You know, it's the, it's the straw that finally broke the camel's back. Uh, we've seen a number of those things, but as you hinted at, there are some very large, very well-known security breaches where the end-user organization they apologized. They gave the mea culpa. They said, hey, I'm going to try harder. And everybody still went back to the store. Everybody still subscribes to their software. They don't pay the permanent price. However, as the service provider, you live in a completely different era of uh, expectation and risk associated with these things, right? Like, think about it this way. You mentioned Target as one of the good old-fashioned examples when uh, not just once, several times they had breaches. Uh, we all know about the one that came in from the, the HVAC contractor, but they had other exposures where they were continuously over a couple of years period uh, making an announcement, people had to get new credit cards, whatever. 
the business of Target is to sell you stuff in a store or in an online environment. Most of the time, you physically get in your car, you go park in the parking lot, you walk into the store, you intended to spend $30, you wound up spending $300. That's their business model, right? Cybersecurity is ancillary, and as practitioners, we want people to take it seriously and believe that it is, quote unquote, mission critical. For a service provider, it is existential. It is literally the reason why we exist. Therefore, the damage to reputation for a service provider in in one case can be a going out of business event. And, and it's something it, – lots, lots of people debate this in the industry – it's not fair. It's not an equal division of risk and reward. Uh, the end user is is protected and shielded. They can always just point to that service provider and go, what? We trusted the professionals, right? Um, that's not fair. It's not equal. And that's real. That That's the bargain we signed up for as, as practitioners in this industry. So uh, I think that it's absolutely vital for us to not get complacent. Just because end user facing organizations don't go out of business when they suffer a reputation damage does not apply to the service provider. We have a higher level of risk and expectation, and we need to live up to that that higher level of expectation. All right, let's continue with the scenario of there being some kind of a damaging compromise or cyber attack of some form. Uh, We can talk about some other uh, scenarios uh, in a little bit. But uh, in your mind, Ryan, uh, what's the the, the playbook for when one of these incidents uh, does actually happen? You know, obviously the best case scenario is, is that you nipped it in the bud, but if you didn't, uh, now there's a, a reputation to rebuild. So there's got to be a, a short-term playbook strategy here, I would imagine, and 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 long-term. Maybe in the short term, you're trying to uh, frame for everybody a little bit what happened, uh, put it in perspective. There's maybe a, a PR uh, element to this. Uh, but long-term, it's, uh, it's probably more of actually doing the work and proving that this was a one-time mistake and you've learned for it from it and it's, and it's not going to happen again. So what's the short-term uh, playbook here? And then what's the, the long-term playbook here? See, it's, it's good to look at it in those two contexts because um, as we've heard guests on our show say before in, in interviews that we've done with them, there's basically the, the old cliche in the industry is that there's two kinds of organizations, those that have been hacked and those that don't realize that they've been hacked, right? Um, it, it, is, it is coming for all of us. And it puts me into a frame of mind of before, during, and after. The essential playbook that we have to operate on is, number one, pre-communicate to your clients to potential clients, to the media at large, that A, we are doing everything we possibly can, and B, there will be problems, right? Uh, We can't set the expectation of perfection because any little mistake looks like a massive breach of trust. We have to let people know that we're doing everything we can. There are many layers and complexities to our operations, the client's operations, individual user behavior, clicking on stuff, malicious internal hacks, right? The, there is a dangerous world out there and breaches will happen. It's not a question of whether or not they will. It is a question of, A, did we anticipate that? And B, do we know how to recover from those things, right? That's the before phase. The during phase is the exact reason why the whole category of technology around SIM exists. Active incident detection, response, recovery, and management. That is something that, that we have to be very trusted and tried professionals around. The, the build a wall around your data and your customers' data and systems and nobody will ever penetrate. We're all way too mature and grown up to believe that that's true anymore. So it brings us, we don't stop doing the protective, preventive work, but we absolutely have to drill and practice for active incident management to ensure that when these things happen, we can recover as rapidly as possible, get back up and running 
and make sure that there is a recovery plan in place to get the customer back to full operation as, as quickly as possible. Uh, to borrow the thoughts from the first half of our show, people, process, and technology. Software is a very effective tool for active incident management, but software alone is not going to solve any of these issues. We have to be ready to communicate effectively internally, to follow predetermined and practice procedures, to get the humans to amp up their level of effort and energy, and then let's actually use the tools to recover whenever possible. The after category, before we let people know stuff's going to break, during we need to be practiced and, you know, that old uh, Rudyard Kipling poem, you know, if you can keep your mind when all about, about you seem to be losing theirs, that's not an accident or a byproduct. That, that's, that's, the, that's the result of practice under pressure. So that has to be the during phase. The after phase is twofold. Number one is the actual recovery and validation that the data and systems are back up, that they are healthy, and that they are hardened to prevent a similar attack from happening again, right? There's a, there's a technical process of recovery and validation after any of these incidents occur. But it's that final piece of the puzzle where we're really focused today, which is the question of, how are you going to communicate with this client, with other clients, with potential clients out there in the marketplace? Because the fact that you had this breach, that you've recovered from it, that is technical. It's operational. Reputation has nothing to do with how smart you are, with how good you are at your job. Your reputation is not the truth. Your reputation is merely what people believe about you and would say about you when you are not in the room. The reputation recovery is the longest process, and it requires a predefined script of internal, client, and external communication to ensure that we can get people back on side and realize, hey, we told you this might happen. We recovered, we did the technical work as aggressively and as effectively as possible. Now, let's talk about the future and what's next going forward. Before, during, and after is the only way that any of us can live through these kinds of breaches and come out with any semblance of a trusted reputation after the fact. What can help add to the messaging, though, to show that you mean business about making sure that uh, whatever mistakes were made uh, during the process of this attack aren't going to happen again. Uh, do you, uh, for example, uh, do you issue uh, a mea culpa? Do you uh, try to give the incident some context to explain some of the extenuating circumstances that uh, perhaps uh, at least explain or justify some of the the controversial decisions that were made. We've even seen you know, some organizations that have suffered a major breach ultimately, uh, if not clean house, bring in some new leadership, perhaps somebody who has uh, experienced a breach before and done cleanup after a, a breach uh, to show, hey, you know, we're bringing in some some fresh blood, some some people who have uh, been been there, done that before. Uh, so that nothing like this particularly uh, happens again. Are, are gestures like that uh, meaningful to an MSSP client audience? I'm, I'm curious as to uh, some of the uh, uh, messaging and, and actions uh, post-incident, uh, especially after one that's damaging that a, an MSSP can take that perhaps does uh, sort of pre present some... Uh, kind of a, a message to the audience of we're going to do things differently here. And what's an empty gesture? You know, it's it's funny. You've probably personally read a hundred or more bad examples of the wrong way to communicate. Right when you when you do the research, when you talk to the people in the industry, there are a lot of statements that come out that they they try to over explain they try to point fingers they try to but but it wasn't my fault man 
after this kind of thing has happened, the bargain we strike in the minds of our customers is we accept that this might happen and we are willing to pay the consequences if and when it does. Uh, to point fingers, to place blame, to go, it was the client, it was their employees. That is absolutely not going to solve the problem because all that says to other clients is, oh, so if something goes wrong with my set, with my systems, then you're going to blame me in the process as well. I don't want to deal with that potential blowback in my reputation. So maybe I'm going to go look for a, a more professional outfit, right? The, the key here is to communicate as though the breach is part of business as usual, right? In the before category, we said, guys, this is hard. We're doing absolutely everything we can, but things will still happen. When they happen, we need to be able to communicate saying, we knew that these kinds of things were out there. Our research indicated that this type of attack was present in the environment and it was something that we would potentially deal with. These are the preventive measures that we took and they weren't enough. So here is how we recovered and how we will continue to operate in, in a more resilient, a more protected way because we've had the bad experience. We've learned from it. We've now improved. If the tone sounds like we're passing blame, well, hey, it wasn't me. It doesn't matter whether that's true or not. You've just alienated everybody who may potentially go through that same experience with you in the future. If it sounds blasé, like, hey, no big deal, man, stuff happens, that's overcorrecting and and you will lose a lot of credibility for being obtuse or tone deaf in the in the relationship. There's that happy medium in there that says, we know this is hard work. It is serious. We saw that this was out there, right? We do our homework. We're aware of the things that are going on. We knew it was a potential thing, but it still got around all of the defenses. That's why we work so hard for active incident response. And we have a trusted protocol to bring the client back up and into full operations as rapidly and with as least disruption to their business as possible. Here's the steps we've taken. Here's what we've learned and how we'll be better in the future. Please let us know if you have any questions, right? That tone is something, it's not defensive, it's not dismissive, but it's not reactionary either. You made the comment about uh, places where serious things have happened and they've made changes in senior leadership. Um, I doubt that there are very many things that could happen in the business of cybersecurity that would warrant such a, an aggressive or drastic action in, in response. If you knew that it was possible and you have the act active incident capabilities and you have an actual people process and technology proven method for recovering, verifying, and hardening the systems in the future, then firing senior managers or, or leaders in the environment, all that says is either, oh, you guys are actually in control over there and you're freaking out and you're totally abandoning your business operation and your leadership structure because of one incident – that's panic inducing. That might make all of your clients run away, right? But it also indicates that perhaps the source of the breach was internal, was that individual, either through some deliberate act or gross negligence. Now, if that's true, that's the one exception to my advice that I, that I could actually see. If we had a bona fide breach of protocol, professionalism, and trust internally. And it was either we just were literally asleep at the wheel and we didn't see things coming, or it is malfeasance on the part of individuals in the organization. Cut them out fast, be aggressive, swallow it. Don't try to protect. Don't try to slip that stuff under in the, you know, on the late Friday night release in the news cycle. Be upfront, make sure everybody knows, and this is what our recovery plan is going forward. Other than those tiny little examples, the, the percentages of actual malfeasance are 
in, in leadership of service provider organizations are astoundingly low. That's, it's fairly, it, it's fairly safe to assume that's not why you're actually going to have this problem. As a result, even the gesture of, well, we're going to fall on our sword and we're going to take the hit for this thing. All that does is trash your reputation. All that does is make you look reactionary, out of control, and potentially culpable for the problem. I would never recommend going that far. It's it's a question of, do we have the systems? Do we actually have the methodology that we're testing? Did we practice? Did we, do, like, did we have a fire drill? And we tested it all and it actually worked. Are we regularly checking our client systems to validate that everything is in working order? Then when bad things happen, the answer is, guys, that's why you work with us. We're professionals. We know how to manage the incident. We know how to recover from the incident to validate and strengthen the systems. This is the time you need us more than ever. Let's be in business together. I think that kind of a tone and that kind of a proactive plan, that might actually attract customers, right? That might cement existing relationships like, wow, I'm glad it didn't happen to me. But if it did, I'm glad that person is in charge because they actually sound like they know what they're talking about. That's very healthy, I think, in in, in our environment. So it's something that, that we need to be very proactive about the communication internally first if that affected customer other customers then potential customers right stakeholders if you will that's the sequence of communication um my my most strenuous piece of advice during the active incident management phase be quiet Right. Like there are going to be regulatory requirements. There are legal requirements in certain instances where you must notify the government. You must notify a regulatory body, an industry institution. There, there are places where that's necessary. Do what's required, but do not try to actively massage the situation during the situation. The worst thing you can do is give faulty information like we think it's this. And it turns out not to be that, and you have to retract, and then that just that's chaos happening. Um, during active incident management, comply with the law and shut up, right? Like, don't be telling people anything more than is legally required. That's what the after phase is for, and that's why you've practiced the incident methodology so that when you need to send these messages out, you, you're not panicking. You already know exactly who to communicate with in each sequence, with which tone, and we do that after the fire is out. We don't talk while the fire is still burning. Sure. Brian, with the last couple of minutes that we have here before we move on to our next segment, let me just bring up the one other scenario that I was uh, hinting at a little bit, which is the idea of you having a customer that, for whatever reason, has become uh, disenchanted with you, doesn't like a particular uh, engagement, isn't happy with the way something went, and now they're starting to perhaps trash you a little bit, uh, whether they're an ex-client or they're still a client, but they're talking to some of their peer group, members of their peer groups and saying, you know, don't use these guys, don't use this MSSP service because uh, X, Y, Z, kind of giving an anti-testimonial in a way. Uh, what do you do in that situation to perhaps help uh, avoid the, uh, the spread of these uh, negative reviews? How do you deal with that particular client? Uh, how do you perhaps uh, nullify some of the, the negative effect that uh, th these bad reviews might be having on your reputation? You know, in, in most cases, legally speaking, the best practice is take your lumps, right? Because uh, there, there are certain schools of thought where people are like, well, I've got a contract with you and it has a non-disparagement clause and you're not allowed to say mean things about me. You know, that might be included in the verbiage of your contract, but trying to enforce it makes you look petty and small. And what you have to be able to admit is not everybody's going to be happy with us, right? In, in the truest sense of, you know, be careful what you wish for because you might actually get it. What we have wished for as service providers is the opportunity to be trusted with something that is so serious and critically important to the business operation that the client can't be trusted to do it themselves. 
They outsource to us because they are not as professional and as capable as we are. When you take on that level of risk and trust, there will be black eyes. You will take a hit. Um, the, the major extent that you can usually go to is to uh, find out, you know, A, if somebody is doing that, who is it? Meet with them directly as soon as possible. Ask for a clearing of the air. Say, hey, what is it that you are dissatisfied with? Is there something that we can do to rectify and get you back to whole? If not, then I will initiate our disengagement protocol and we will allow you out of the contract without further penalties, right? You're not going to be in breach. We will mutually agree that you will be uh, moving on as soon as possible. We have a plan in place for disengagement. Obviously, that's one of the communication protocols that we have to anticipate. In the aftermath, when we're communicating with existing clients and with potential clients, people will say mean things about us in that environment. We need to be able to say it's a very difficult environment. We knew that this was a potential risk. We did everything there that could possibly be done. Here's how we managed the active incident. Here's how we've recovered and verified that things are better. Here is how we will operate going forward. We are happy to have this conversation. I think that that tone can prevent a lot of lasting impact because you know what? Uh, what's the old uh, statistical reality that uh, a satisfied customer will likely tell one person, a dissatisfied customer will tell somewhere between six and 10? That's life. We deal with things where emotions run high because risk is meaningful. And if it has very significant and expensive impacts on customers, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, that people say mean things about us. If you can't handle that kind of bad mouthing in the marketplace and you don't know how to be resilient and professional and communicate through that, hey, you know, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen is my last cliche in today's conversation. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's our thought process. What do you think about it? We obviously have uh, a million ideas that we can't fit into the time of today's program. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are. So please reach out to us, Cyber for Hire at CyberRiskAlliance.com. That's our email address. You can reach us through our show page as well. What are your experiences managing reputations after negative security situations. Do you have best practices? Do you have uh, horror stories to tell? We would love to get your advice. We'd also like to be able to commiserate with you when and if that is necessary. So please reach out and let's keep this conversation going. Now, we want to move into our next segment. And uh, this is what we call Dear Cyber for Hire. Uh, this is our advice column segment where we get to play marriage counselor between MSSPs and their clients to help mend fences, make sure people love each other whenever anything might go awry. So the letter that we're going to share today has been dramatized for the purpose of protecting the innocent, but make no mistake, this situation is as real as possible, and we hope to be able to provide you with some advice on how to manage through this part of the relationship between you and your clients. Bradley, what is today's drama? All right, Ryan. Yes, well, we are back with more juicy MSSP melodrama. And this one comes from the provider side of the relationship. So, fellas, cue the music. Dear Cyber for Hire, awaken me from this terrible nightmare. My once honorable partner, has turned to a life of delinquency. No, they're not out there committing crimes, although I certainly feel robbed. Because you see, my client is extremely delinquent with their payments. Multiple months behind, in fact, and I'm starting to feel like the proverbial doormat. If they don't settle up soon, I may have to lay down the law, but I'm afraid of looking like the bad guy when I really do need their business. How do I get my partner to pay up? Pennilessly yours, desperately demanding delayed, deferred, and delinquent dinero disbursements in Dallas. 
Uh, Ryan, is there a tactful yet effective way of getting a delinquent company to settle up? At what point do you even maybe, you know, put a hold on your services or enact some kind of consequences for not getting paid? You know, th- think about it this way, Bradley. Can you imagine the consequences if you just woke up one day and flipped a switch and turned off your managed security services for a particular client? Um, not only would that not be graceful, not only would that not be, you know, uh, unflappable professional in the in the environment that we hope to come across as that could probably get you some legal consequences because as we've been saying today, um, you do something mission critical. And if you just beep, turned it off one day and stopped providing that service, you are going to cause vulnerabilities, exposures, and potential business problems that the client cannot recover from, even if they are in arrears in their uh, in their payment with you just turning them off one day without opportunity to cure, without notice, without forewarning and preparation, that is going to be the fastest path to a courtroom for your service business, unfortunately. This is another case of before, during, and after. You begin with the after part of it. When this happens, you know that you need to communicate with the client that, hey, we are beyond the point of what is acceptable. We need to look for a planned disengagement. You know, let's use the Gwyneth Paltrow, the uh, conscious uncoupling with, with our with our customers. Um, We know that that's going to happen. So how can we do that as smoothly, as systematically as possible without exposing ourselves to risk or our client to undue exposure and risk in the marketplace? That's something we need to script. We need to know step one, step two, step three. How do we wrap up their database and all of their user information and pass that along to an internal person of responsibility. If they're moving away from us and to a new service provider, how will we do the transfer of information and the cutover so that the service does not have unnecessary interruptions? That's a little bit of communication process, but that's an awful lot of I's and T's to be dotted and crossed in the in the technical part of that decommissioning process. That's not something we should figure out as we go. We should script that very, very carefully. That's the after phase, right? Unfortunately, there are times when customers just don't pay. You got to go and you need to know how that is happening, which begs the question in the during phase, when they go from up to date to not up to date, how do you manage through that process? My answer is There is such a thing in this world as bad revenue. There are bad customers. There are bad clients. There are bad contracts. I know it feels like we're going to pay a price by losing that customer. They pay us sometimes. We need their money most of the time, right? Uh, We feel like that's going to cause us a problem. I can tell you from bad experiences that keeping that non-paying client around for too long causes more problem, more disruption to other parts of your operation than it is ever worth in cash, let's make sure that we have very clearly communicated standards and that we stick to those standards without variation, right? If it is net 30 and you get a guys, we're about to turn your service off, net 60, and uh, we are initiating our protocol, net 90, the protocol's done, you guys are gone, and somebody else is responsible for your services, pick your own dates, right? Some people are going to be net 10, net 20, net 30, because they don't have any tolerance for late payment. Others are going to be a little bit more forgiving, go 30, 60, 90. I'm not here to tell you what your personality is, but I am here to say, When you set those numbers, you communicate them clearly to your clients and you absolutely positively never vary from those expectations or you will become the doormat, right? Which gets us back to the before category of how do you make sure that customers know what your threshold is, understand their responsibility and are not likely to fall into delinquency to begin with? Let's just put it this way. A lot of people in this industry make the mistaken assumption that because I have a contract, 
then I will never have delinquent receivables. I mean, it's not like a purchase, right? It's they sign the contract. They pay me on the first of the month, every single month. Contract means it's always going to happen, right? Um, If that were true, there would not be lawyers in this world. (laughs) And we all know that there are. That means that you will, unfortunately, probably experience this at some point. What we need to do is to communicate ahead of time with our customers this this is the service we will provide. These are the financial terms and conditions. These are the consequences that happen if and when there is something that, that goes awry in that process. I don't like accounts receivable and collecting on delinquent accounts. You don't like it. I yet to meet a technical professional who doesn't break out in hives when they think about that kind of a process. You know what? That's one of the really good reasons to have a CFO, to have an accounting professional, to outsource to an accounting professional service provider. Have somebody else be the bad guy. You get to be the visionary. You get to be the operational guru, the one who's here to maintain good and happy client relationships. And it's really good to have a bulldog on your team so that when things go wrong, they follow up with a very friendly and professional tone immediately on the first day of delinquency and then again the following week, the following, et cetera, right? Don't put that into your operational dynamics. Make that a dedicated professional function that somebody else on your team gets to be the mean guy about, right? Uh, Outsourcing is good. That's why we have jobs as service providers. There are other service providers who can do that gnarly piece of business for us as well. Or, or hear me out here, Ryan, uh, sending some big, burly, brass-knuckled enforcement goon to your client's headquarters and, you know, being like, it's a nice database you have here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. You know, uh, we did observe lawyers exist. So do cousins Tony. Right. Uh, there, there are there are many cousins named Tony in this world and, and stuff happens. I don't want to have that attached to my reputation, but uh, I do know that there are people who do have that attached to their reputation. I don't want to go afoul of those people. So, you know, it's it's always good to uh, let people know when you sign contracts with them. It, it's funny, right? Like that's the moment of truth where people really start to learn whether or not you mean business and whether they take you seriously in the yeah. terms and conditions of a contract, um, bring your lawyer, right? Yeah. Like that's not just a salesperson activity or you as the leader of the organization. Uh, when we sign contracts, we bring cousin Tony with us to the meeting and he smiles and he's happy. He, he's leaving all the brass knuckles in his pocket at that point, but everybody knows who he is and why he's at the table so that they are not likely to run afoul and get another visit when Tony's not quite so happy. Sure. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, Another relationship saved. Uh, Hopefully our listeners have learned from this and don't make the same mistake. And remember, if you've been struggling with your managed security services relationship, whether you're the user or the provider, we want to hear from you. So please write to us at cyberforhire at cyberriskalliance.com and we might use your letter in a future episode. In the meantime, as any security practitioner can tell you, there's no shortage of headlines filling up the cyber news feeds every single day. So we wanted to highlight a few items that we curated just for you in this lightning round that we call the security detail. And headline number one goes to you, Ryan. Google has launched a new cybersecurity certificate program. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about that, would you? Yeah, absolutely. So in the world of... There are 755,000 odd open positions in cybersecurity just in the United States. Um, It's good to see somebody do something tactical. Now, uh, Google, a number of years ago, it actually started in 2018. They launched a program with a limited number of certificates that were based on best practice in industry for very specific job functions. They looked at data analytics. They looked at project management, at UI, UX design. These are things that they looked around and said, hey, there's not enough of these professionals. So let's do a training program. Now, 
What's interesting about their program is not just the curriculum, well, which is good because, I mean, think about it, right? Like Google does UI, UX design and data analytics and project management. If there's anybody in the wide world who might know about those topics, it's probably the people who already work at Google, right? That, that, that's a very good assumption to make. So they took good curriculum. They put it out there in a digital format. They made it infinitely available to anybody in a, in a digital on-demand environment. And what's more, they made it surprisingly, startlingly affordable, where you could actually get through this program, obtain a certificate, and be able to improve your job prospects. But they went a step further here, and this is where I think it's very, very interesting and important. What Google said was, if you are a person out there in the world and you complete this certificate and you receive that endorsement from Google, Google will treat that credential as equivalent to higher education requirements for an open job position that they're trying to fill, right? If it says must have four-year degree and you go to Google and say, but I also have a Google certificate instead of a four-year degree, Google says, well, if we don't stand behind our own training, why would anybody else? We'll hire you on that basis. That's a bold step. They have now added cybersecurity to that program. In just the last couple of years, uh, in their uh, original certificates that Google has put out there, they've put through more than 150,000 individuals through this program, and their goal is to amp that up aggressively. Google's not going to solve all the problems in the world. Everybody still needs all hands on deck to fill these job positions, but this is good news. This is a step in the right direction. Kudos to the Google folks for the certificate program, and uh, everybody else should be inspired. Let's see what else we can do to also fill those 750-odd thousand open positions. All right, headline number two, Bradley. Um, survey recognizes human talent as a vital aspect of incident response. We like to think we're important in the process. What does the research say, Bradley? Well, the, the research actually agrees with that notion. Uh, in a survey of security and IT professionals recently conducted by the Cyber Risk Alliance, 73% of the uh, respondents who participated said that their uh, place of employment has an incident response playbook. Uh, now, a little bit of a smaller number, only 63%, said that they had a specific team in place dedicated to incident response, such as a SOC or a CERT. And yet the organizations that do have a team in place gave themselves uh, the highest incident response readiness scores amongst all of the participants in the survey. So in keeping with that people, process, and technology theme from part one of our show, we can see how having the right people in place can also ensure that some of the processes that you've also instituted and established uh, help, help those processes uh, work uh, more efficiently and more properly. Uh, the problem is, of course, that talent is scarce, as we've talked about many times. 49% uh, of respondents identified a lack of qualified IT or security staff as their biggest IR challenge. Amongst the most, uh, among the most coveted skills that they seek from IR staffers, uh, problem solving was number one, followed by team skills. Uh, for more on this research, uh, I would encourage you to register for SC Media's May 2023 Incident Response E-Summit uh, virtual conference, uh, which is currently available for uh, viewing on demand uh, on the SC Media website. All right, uh, headline number three, uh, courts and 911 services disrupted following a ransomware attack on Dallas. Tell us more, Ryan. You know, uh, earlier today, we made the comment that bad things happen even to very large and vital operations out there in the world. Uh, earlier, it was a healthcare example. This one is the, the actual city of Dallas, Texas. Um, imagine a world where police can't communicate, courts can't function, 911 cannot receive calls, and there are other critical systems that are associated with their with their daily operations. And those things were compromised by ransomware causing widespread service outages. Um, you know, if if I find myself in a position needing 911 and I call and you can't help me out in that situation, um, 
I'm sorry, our servers are down because we had a ransomware attack is not a a response that I'm going to be happy to receive. Uh, This is a call to all service professionals that deal anywhere in the public sector. Uh, You and I have talked at length before, Bradley, about critical infrastructure and these operating environments. We looked at that from a federal systems point of view, from a from a gas and electric point of view, from all of the things that keep the lights on and keep us safe in this world. Uh, my advice is state, local, city, right? State, county, city, and right down to uh, city councils, right down to town councils, uh, any neighborhood HOAs. These are operating bodies that exist for a reason. And they need a service provider who will come in and say, let's do an audit here on your system. A, let's figure out if you've got any vulnerabilities. B, let's do a little cybersecurity preparedness training for your people so they don't click on things like this. And let's put in place a resilience and recovery plan to ensure if bad things happen, you can get back up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, One would like to have assumed that the city of Dallas, Texas, of all the cities in the in the great 50 states, would have been large enough to have had a plan like that. Turns out, not so much. So if Dallas didn't, I'm thinking there are many other cities, little towns, local to you as a service provider, that need a phone call as soon as possible so that we can prevent this and other similar situations from happening again. Okay? Finally, headline number four, Bradley, uh, state of cybersecurity, CRA research findings. Um, what uh, what else can, can we learn from the Cyber Risk Alliance research that is just being published? Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, it's this twenty twenty <clears throat> excuse me twenty twenty three uh, global state of cybersecurity study. This particular one with a focus on the uh, the U S. Uh, this 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 uh, research was uh, published uh, in conjunction with uh, Infoblocks and contains some of the uh, survey responses from approximately 1,300 security uh, pros, uh, all really looking at uh, some, some trends uh, following the, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, how the, the, the work from a home culture and, and, and security processes around that uh, continue to proliferate. So since the start of the pandemic, uh, approximately uh, half of uh, all organizations uh, have uh, responded uh, to the needs of the remote workforce and, and, and customers by uh, fast-tracking uh, digital uh, transformations. That's about 52%. Uh, 45% added resources to networks and databases, and 44% increased support for customer portals. Uh, this all according to an SC Media uh, article from Steve Zurier that uh, did a nice job of, uh, of summarizing uh, this particular research. Uh, also, about a third of respondents said that their organization has hired more IT staff, uh, also uh, moved more apps to third-party cloud providers, and placed network and security controls uh, on the edge. So uh, these are all just continuing trends that we see that uh, uh, basically the, the work from anywhere is, is not going anywhere. We discussed this a little bit actually in our on our previous episode. Uh, a couple of more little uh, interesting points. In the past year, 51% report, reported that their organization added VPNs or firewalls and cloud-managed DDI servers uh, to their networks. And uh, Bring your own device trend also continuing. About 48% of respondents reporting uh, remote employee-owned devices being added to their networks. Uh, among the uh, the greatest security concerns related uh, to uh, the prominence of the remote workforce uh, that includes at the top of the list data leakage, uh, ransomware. Uh, cloud attacks and attacks through remote worker connections. Uh, those are among the most lingering concerns. Uh, all right, well, that's that, but uh, we have one more news item to go, and it is, drumroll please, our irrelevant news item of the week. Now, this is a real news pitch that Ryan or I have received in our inboxes for reasons that are entirely inexplicable to us. Are you ready, Ryan? I am ready. 
All right. Well, with summer approaching, interest in pickleball continues to surge. In fact, the number of people playing pickleball grew by 159% over three years to 8.9 million in 2022. Any interest in covering pickleball search data compiled by keyword research firm Senrush or Connecting with pickleball equipment company Just Paddles? Well, no, we don't have any interest in, in that because uh, we're a, a cybersecurity company, thank you. But I do recognize that pickleball has become uh, this really huge, crazy phenomenon. It's this, uh, it's like the Goldilocks racket game. It is a smaller court than tennis. It is bigger than ping pong. Uh, have you been sucked up in this fad at all, Ryan? Uh, you know, I... I play. I am not obsessed. It, it is something I, w I will absolutely endorse exactly where you were going. Anybody, even without skills to play tennis, can absolutely pick up this game and have a very good time. Uh, what I'm fascinated by is not just how many people are getting involved and how frequently they're playing. Uh, I actually have a, a friend who started up a new business in refinishing basketball and tennis courts to make them into pickleball courts. And uh, he's booked out literally six months in advance uh, mm -hmm. on these services. So uh, you, you, can, you can absolutely vouch for the fact this is growing. Wonder what I think is the most interesting part of this the number of HOA organizations that are now outlawing pickleball from courts <laughs> that are too close to residence units. Because, uh, Bradley, if you've played pickleball, not only is it super fun, but you will also acknowledge it's not quiet, right? Uh, yeah. It's a hard paddle and a hard ball on a hard court. Um, and people whoop and holler and they enjoy themselves. Um, uh, apparently, one of the good things about tennis, not, not only do you actually need to be good at playing it, but it comes with the presumption of decorum associated with playing that game. Um, I'm not aware of any presumption of decorum when it comes to pickleball. <laughs> yes, well, I see that could be confusing, though, if a member of the Homeowner Association says, I'll see you in court. Well, now, are they saying I want to play or, or are they saying, yeah. you know, I'm... I'm gonna I'm gonna take you to court and uh, and 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 challenge this uh, pickleball court being uh, placed a little bit too closely to my living room. Um, I I have not personally played pickleball myself. I would be curious to try. I would say maybe the most uh, fad like sport that I've tried recently, and I think the fad kind of has passed a little bit uh was i tried curling not too long ago and that was really big a nice. couple of olympics ago uh when the u.s uh won and you know and and everybody was like oh these guys are just like us like uh, i don't really need to be an athlete uh to, to to curl and uh i know i think that's a little bit of the appeal to pickleball too is i mean you can be in shape but also this really appeals to people of all uh ages and physique so uh considering i'm not particularly in the best physique, maybe a uh, pickleball would be a, a good thing for me to pick up. But See, I, uh, think, I think it's a great, it, it's a great pastime for you to, to pursue there, Bradley, because it is, it is very fun, right? But in, yeah. in exactly the same spirit as curling, um, it's a sport that you get better at the yes. more you drink. So uh, <laughs> I will say uh, if, if the phenomenon of curling has, has abated a little bit in the United States, for the sake of our friends north of the border in uh, in Canada, oh, it, it not only is it not abating up there, it's more popular than ever. And it, it's a, you know, when you're outside on ice in the winter and you're playing a game that involves an awful lot of standing around, you know, the it, it's almost like official issued equipment, right? Like you can't play that game without a drink in your hand it would be it would be unwise to do that without a beverage so i am i am on team curling for yeah. sure all right. Fair enough. Uh, although I do say that a, a little too much drinking, you might be a little tipsy and then I'm not sure you really want to be in a giant slippery patch of ice when you've already don't have maybe your best sense of balance. But what do I know? Uh, all right. Speaking of pickleball, uh, we're in a little bit of a pickle right now because we are definitely out of time. So we're going to have to wrap things up. But don't worry, because we'll be back again soon enough for episode number 21. Uh, meanwhile, feel free to check out even more cybersecurity podcast content on the SC Media, MS.
SSP Alert and Channel EDE websites. Until next time, I'm Bradley Barth. And I am Ryan Morris. Please reach out to us via our show page and our email address at cyberforhire at cyberriskalliance.com with any of your comments, questions, and insights about the business of cybersecurity. And then we'll be happy to keep this conversation going on the next episode of Cyber for Hire, your inside source for cyber outsourcing.